Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we are taking a look at a fantastically cool French sniper rifle, one that I never thought I would actually get my hands on here in the US. However, a whole bunch of them have been, well not a whole bunch, a small number of them have been imported, uh, and so they are now available to people. This is an FRF2, and that stands for Fusil à Répétition Modèle F2. The French really liked using F designations, uh, kind of like in the US military we have a lot of M's, M1's, M2's, you know, all different sorts of items designated M1. Uh, the French have a whole bunch of things designated F. Uh, F, for example, with the F1's you have the FRF1 snipers, you have the FAMAS F1 uh, rifles, you have the F1 grenades, and so on and so forth. Anyway, this is an FRF2. And it is a squad sniper rifle chambered for the 7.62 NATO cartridge. Now when the French developed the FRF1, which I will say is mechanically identical to this, they are essentially the same gun. This is, the short version is, this is an FRF1 rebarreled to 7.62 NATO and given a new front end. Well when the French were developing the FRF1 they actually looked into using the 7.62 NATO cartridge. At the time they hadn't really come to a final decision on whether France would join the NATO alliance, and so they experimented with NATO cartridges, ultimately uh, chose not to join the NATO weapons standardization, uh, and went with their own 7.5 cartridge. However, by the late 1970s things had changed a bit. The adoption of the FAMAS in 1977 in 5.56 was leading to a phase out of the 7.5 cartridge. The AA-52 machine guns had already been converted over to 7.62 NATO as the AAF-1, there's our F again, and it was clear that without the, the MOS 49.56 rifles the 7.5 cartridge was obsolete, and it made a lot more sense to convert the FR sniper rifles to 7.62 NATO. So uh, the Saint-Étienne Armory, or MOS, began working on testing, uh, once again, testing 7.62 caliber uh, FR sniper rifles in 1980. They specifically started working on what would become the FRF2 in 1984, and it was formally adopted in 1986. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at it, and I'll show you it, it, what's going on with this thing, because it's got a lot of really interesting features. As I've said before, a French copy no one, and no one copies the French, and there's some pretty unique stuff on here. Let's start with a little bit more about where the FRF2s came from, because these guns were never actually manufactured as new firearms. Every single FRF2 started its life as an FRF1. There were only 6,000 FRF1s originally manufactured. They were produced in the late 1960s, 66-67 uh, production began, and, and ended pretty quickly. A run of 6,000 rifles for a major arsenal like this does not take more than a couple years. So by the time the 1980s roll around and they decide they want a new sniper rifle, the production tooling's gone, the production line is long shut down. And so what they decided to do was just bring in the existing F1s, because they actually really didn't need more of them, and everything except the barrel was going to be in just perfectly good condition, most of the other stuff doesn't really wear out. And so they brought in 3,500 of the 6,000 FRF1s and simply upgraded them to FRF2 pattern. When they did this they milled off the original markings, which is why we've got a little scalloped depression right here, and instead of FRF1 caliber 7.5 they remarked them FRF2 caliber 7.62 N for NATO. The original serial numbers remain on the guns. So MAS is manufactured design de Saint-Étienne, the Saint-Étienne arsenal, became Giat owned by Nexter and then eventually shut down, and all of the serial numbers for the FR series guns, or the FRF1 and 2, are F prefix, because the French really have a thing for that F prefix uh, designation, and then a five digit serial number with a leading zero. So there were no new serial numbers issued. Uh, this is in fact one of the late production FRF1s that was then converted to F2 configuration. And the only other mark actually on the rifle is the US import mark right there on the back, uh, well the bottom of the receiver just behind the magazine. The back end of the guns remained exactly the same as on the FRF1, so there's a very simple safety here that just flips down. And how's this for a complicated safety mechanism? When the safety's down, the trigger can't go far enough back to fire. Presto, done. And to disengage it, as a right-hander it is super quick and easy, you simply flip it up out of the way. 
At the back we have a rotating sling swivel here, we have a solid plastic, there isn't a recoil pad of any kind here, but we have a solid plastic butt plate. Note that it is sort of slotted in place because the gun came with adjustment spacers so that you could extend the length of pull if you wanted to do so. Um, and to do that you take this screw in the back and it's just threaded through this plug. So take the screw out and you can add spacers in. There is also a cheek rest here which is removable. It is simply held in place by these two pins on the inside which drop into these sleeved holes. And there are two versions of this, there's the short one, which is this, and there's a taller one for scopes that are larger. Speaking of the bolt, uh, it's really quite simple, straight bolt handle, rotates 90 degrees so it stays out of the way of our scope here. And this is essentially a MOS 36 action. Now it doesn't use MOS 36 parts, they're not interchangeable, uh, but the basic design was built on the MOS 36 system. There is really only one small bit of disassembly, I can take the bolt apart. So step one is take off the cheek rest, then I'm going to pull the bolt out the back, you pull the trigger to depress the sear, and then the bolt can come out. Being based on the MOS 36 this has two rear locking lugs there, big flat spring extractor up there, cut out for a fixed ejector. To disassemble it further we have M for montage or assembled and D for demontage or disassembled and a little notch there. So I can take this, press it in, rotate it 90 degrees, and the striker spring and its guide come out. We can then drop the firing pin, and uh, fairly similar in assembly to the Arasaka, actually the, the type 38 type 99 Arasakas. That's the complete bolt assembly, that's all there is to it. So it's a, a very simple, easy to work with uh, mechanism. We have a 10 round box magazine. The magazine release is a little bit unusual. When you push here you're actually lifting up this end of the magazine release, which allows us to drop the magazine. That's the magazine catch right there. Holds 10 rounds, uh, double stack, double feed magazine. They have these rubber base plates to protect the bottom of the magazine. You can pop that off and it's actually very similar to a 4956 uh, magazine. The front end here is where all the changes happened. So obviously the barrel changed, they went to a 762 NATO barrel, same length, 600 millimeters, 23.6 inch, a relatively light profile barrel, not, not a pencil weight barrel, but a fairly light barrel. The intention here was for this to be more like a sniper rifle than designated marksman's rifle, and it was not intended to be able to deliver significant sustained fire. If you do that the barrel will heat up and the point of impact will shift. This was designed for a balance of uh, handling and portability, and first round accuracy. So that's the barrel hiding under all this stuff. We have a new bipod. This bipod is attached on a sleeve right here that actually sits over the barrel, and in, a set, in, in effect the gun is actually hanging from the bipod uh, when it's up. So we can push this button in, which allows me to rotate the bipod leg down, and with the gun on the bipod I have a significant amount of freedom of movement here without moving the bipod feet. So I can rotate this way, I can rotate the gun uh, clockwise and counterclockwise like that. You can also extend the bipod legs out that far, and to retract them we just push up on there, slide the bipod back in. So if you need the bipod taller you can do that. There are some nice little rubber feet on the bottom of the bipod to give it some traction right there. Now the most distinctive feature here which is this plastic shield on the entire front end of the gun. That's certainly the thing that gets the most notoriety, and it's really pretty immediately visibly evident. Well this is a thermal shield. When these were developed in the 1980s we were seeing some of the early really common use of infrared night vision in military circles. This is roughly the same sort of period when you would see for example the US military introduce uh, desert night camo, or night camo, um, that actually worked really well against first generation uh, night vision devices. The idea here is because this has a relatively thin barrel, 
it doesn't take very many rounds for the barrel to heat up, and once it heats up it stands out really obviously on night vision. And so you can prevent that by shrouding the whole thing in this lightweight polymer sheath. It also prevents any mirage from affecting the shooter's vision through the scope, because all the, the heat and the hot air is trapped inside this shield. And that is why we have this sort of soft rubber gasket at the front. The barrel's free-floated in here. You can see I can move it, well I'm moving the, the shroud around it. Um, but this keeps hot air inside, which again prevents it from being visible under night vision, um, and doesn't actually impinge on the barrel. Interestingly, where the FRF1 had backup iron sights, very very big gross backup iron sights on the barrel, on the F2 those iron sights have been replaced or repositioned on this plastic thermal shroud. So there's our rear sight, and there's our front. Uh, those aren't intended to be sniping sights, uh, the idea is they're basically emergency backup irons, or in this case plastics. Note that this can be adjusted for windage because it's fit in there in a little dovetail mount. The F2 continued the use of the adjustable tunable muzzle device that was on the FRF1. This now has three ports in it because it is three groove rifling, and you can unscrew this locking bar and adjust the uh, muzzle device for both length in and out, and so that the slots line up with the lanes and grooves in the barrel. And that's a way to help tweak the, the best bit of accuracy out of the gun and its ammunition. Also interesting to note that on the bottom here of what is sort of a, it's a hard plastic uh, thermal shield, there is a rubberized flat pad here which allows you to brace the rifle, to rest the rifle, on what could otherwise be fairly slippery surfaces and get some traction. And this is just a little piece that pops on and off. Got the front sling swivel right there. Lastly, but not least, let's take a look at the optic up here. This is a quick detach optic, so if I take that lever back I can slide this right off. We have three attachment surfaces here, here, and here that slide onto a three-part very proprietary rail on the top of the receiver. And this is of course again a carryover from the original FRF1. This is the same optic that was developed originally for the MOS 49 uh, for its use on the FR series rifles. Essentially the only thing they did was take the windage graduations and make them twice as precise. So they, they cut the, basically they divided every click into two clicks, so that you got approximately two MOA clicks. It's like a three centimeter at a hundred meter clicks. They are by today's standards extremely gross adjustments. But that was the scope from the FRF1. For the FRF2 they made two changes. First was they changed the bullet drop compensating cam from 7.5 French to 7.6 uh, to NATO, obviously. And that BDC is calibrated from point blank out to 800 meters in 50 meter increments. And by the way, the dash 04 here indicates that this is the version of the scope that was used on the FRF2. The 04 is the 7.62 NATO cam. The 03 version, right there, is the FRF1 version, which simply means that it's got those windage adjustments made more precise. And by the way here, both the eye cup on the back and the sunshade on the front are removable. This one's tight, I'm going to leave it on because I like having it there. Um, and if you need to you can rotate it around depending on you know, if you're trying to shoot into a close angle on the sun. Anyway, the other change they made was to make this scope mount, basically split the scope mount. So we have our rings on this sort of funky proprietary base, which then attaches with a pair of screws through this which is set up to take a, it's a weaver style rail, so it can take either weaver mounts or with these screw spacings you can fit Stanag style scopes or rings. Uh, mechanically the internals of the scope itself remained unchanged. This is, believe it or not, all of a 3.85 power scope with a very heavy German post reticle. It is totally 1940s technology, it is essentially a mildly improved German ZF4 scope. Um, 
but this is actually what was in use with the FRF1 in 1986, and it would continue to be used on the FRF2 until 1995. And in 95, the French Army replaced this with the Scrome J8, which was a fixed 8 power magnification scope. Um, we'll talk about the J8 in a separate video if I'm ever able to get my hands on one. Those are extremely difficult to find. They were only ever basically used by the French Army, and frankly they're not a very good scope. Um, but they are what was chosen for the military contract. Now the FRF2s were used by more than just the French Army, so it was also used by other branches of the French military, and so you would have some other scopes that were that saw service. The Gendarmerie, for example, used uh, like 3 to 12 power uh, Schmidt and Bender scopes, as well as a couple versions of 10 power fixed loopholes. The French Navy commandos used a 1.5 to 6 power Schmidt and Bender, uh, and so on. So it was really, actually it was the French Army had the I, I'll say it, the worst scopes uh, kind of possible on these guns, and yet they remain remarkably capable rifles. The FRF2 was the standard French sniper rifle from 1986 when it was adopted until approximately 2019, 2020. Uh, in 2018 the French started a trials testing regime to find a new rifle to replace it. They wanted something specifically self-loading, and ultimately they chose to adopt the FN SCAR Heavy in 7.62. And so that has been replacing the FRF2 as the standard French sniper rifle. Um, to be honest, I think I'd rather have the FRF2 myself. And what do you know, I actually do have this one. So uh, if you're interested in these, they are available in the US. Uh, a little bit of googling will bring up where you can find them. And uh, well, I think we need to take this thing out to the range, because I've wanted to get my hands on one of these for a very long time now. So stay tuned tomorrow, we'll take it out to the range. And then uh, coming up, I'm going to be using this beauty in Desert Brutality uh, in some real on-the-clock competition. So we'll have that in a week or two. Thanks for watching, hopefully you enjoyed the video.